Hi, I'm Kirby Allison, and in today's video, I'm very excited to welcome a fellow YouTuber into our studio today, uh, Teddy Baldassar. Of course, he is well known on the internet, over 800,000 subscribers for his incredible content on watches. Of course, as all of you know, this is a world into itself, uh, and I'm so excited to welcome Teddy into the studio today to talk to Kirby. us about watches. Pleasure. Uh, and uh, how these you know, timepieces really intersect the world of the well-dressed and those passionate about quality, craftsmanship, and tradition. So, Kobe, I first want to say I'm a big fan of your content. <laughs> Thank you. I, uh, I have some Hangar Project products oh, in, in my yeah. home, and it's a pleasure to be here with you today. Yeah. Well, this is one of the, my, my greatest uh, you know, privileges uh, and pleasures on this channel is the opportunity to collaborate you know, with other creators you know, that are passionately pursuing you know, whatever it is, uh, is their interest. And uh, for you, Teddy, and your watch content, I mean, you really are one of the leading people out there on YouTube, you. you know, really exploring this world and opening it up for everyone on the internet so that they can develop um, uh, their appreciation uh, for these uh, fine timepieces, much in the same way I'd like to think that we do for bespoke clothing, bespoke shoes. I think there's a lot of parallels, yeah. right? There's, and I'll start with this because this is all slightly absurd, yeah. in, in a way. I mean, we're looking at watches here that are going to be thousands of dollars. We're going to be looking at some that are a little bit more attainable, but mm -hmm. attainable is relatively speaking. Yeah, that's right? right, yeah. And the thing that's just kind of insane about this is just how it can just kind of take off into this beautiful unraveling of discovery. Yeah. And for me, that's, that's really what happened with watches. There's just such a density for the subject matter. It just mm -hmm. keeps me interested. But what we're looking at here today is mostly mechanical watches. Yeah. And mechanical watches, for context, we're looking at these small objects that we can wear on our wrist, over 200 components in a basic automatic movement. You think about a combustion engine is around 200 parts. Then you're thinking about, this is able to tell the time with just springs, gears, yeah. pinions, screws. And in the case of an automatic watch, it's being powered by our own motion. And it's, it's, a, it's a marvel of engineering. And it's almost, in a way, it, it is you know, timeless. Yeah. Because these are also able to... Ex extend beyond our own disposable world. I mean, this can outlive me. Yeah. It can outlive me. And I know you have watches that are very old in your collection and that you love as well. And whether you're getting a bespoke suit, you are you know, getting like a fine piece of bespoke footwear, th there's something about just the quality of it that just transcends the object itself. Yeah. And that's why I love watches. There's history here, there's artistry, there's beauty. And I think that's something that, if anybody's maybe watching this and has yeah. never investigated this any further, I think it's just, Open yourself up to, yes, this is going to be an kind of an absurd subject. You don't need a watch nowadays. Yeah. But it's just about doing what is exceptional. It's about doing what is, I think, beautiful and something that can really tell a story in itself. Yeah. Well, I think there's an interesting story of humanity. I mean, I say this and in, in, in kind of our, uh, on our channel that, you know, there's a misplaced emphasis on the product in many ways that has people miss the humanity of the people creating it mm -hmm. and the stories, you know, the quality, the craftsmanship, the tradition. And whenever I look at watchmaking, it's, you know, the parallels are exactly the same. I mean, these are in many cases made entirely by hand, mm -hmm. by people who have dedicated their entire life to this obscure, you know, science that is horology. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, now, of course, you know, we have the aid of modern, you know, uh, machines and technology and computers. But in its beginning, this was all done by hand. I mean, yes. all of the, the technical drawings and the you know, engineering and even, you know, the filing down of the gears was done in an analog way. That's, uh, that to me, I think is one of the most, that's what initially drew me into mechanical watches is just how profound it is that that is even possible. And I always think about this too, is a watch is one of the things that you spend the most time with of any object in your life. I don't know about you, what your process is in the morning, I don't know, but the first thing I will potentially put on, sometimes it's almost a watch, when I walk out the door. Yeah. And then the last thing I usually take off when I go into bed is a watch. Yeah. I mean, it is something that is connected to you and it can live beyond you. And I think, as you're mentioning all these points about yeah. the craftsmanship, now we're gonna be looking at a variety of different watches, some of them more, very much hand yeah. assembled in terms of finishing and all of that. And then you also have ones that are more of a, you know, kind of that entry level position where, yeah. yes, there's some machine operation. Yes, it's more of an assembly line, but still you're talking about watches that are parts over a hundred, right? Yeah. To make these things. It is a pretty interesting category. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I, we often say this, or I do at least with hangers. It's one of the first things you touch in the morning mm -hmm. is your hanger, you know, as you walk into your closet. And so again, it's one of those small opportunities for, for refinement where, you know, you can be thoughtful and deliberate about the way you 
you know, store your clothing, right? Wooden hangers like we sell here, you know, at KirbyAllison.com, or just your timepiece, mm -hmm. right? Or your shoes. Uh, and I think that again, on the internet, it's easy for people to kind of take this uh, too far, right? Where you don't need to be wearing a several hundred thousand dollar Patek Philippe no. in order to be someone that appreciates, you know, the quality, the craftsmanship and tradition behind a fine timepiece. In the same way that you don't need a pair of bespoke shoes in order to appreciate fine footwear, you can have a pair of Allen Edmonds mm -hmm. that you polish and take care of. And those are beautiful shoes. And I think that this is where it's so important to not get moral. And so I know whenever we were talking about you coming, um, you know, we we're talking about the timepieces. And so, you know, I asked you, of course, to bring some nice things, but then also bring some things, you know, that still are consistent with, you know, these virtues, but more accessible. And so we've got a pretty awesome lineup here. Yeah. But before we get started, I just think we have to first get out of the way. What are you wearing on your wrist? Well, should I save it? Because this is going to <laughs> yeah. be our grand finale. Okay, That's so we'll save this. Okay, let's save finale. this to the end. Okay, so we won't uh, ruin it. You have to what are you stick wearing? around. What are you wearing? Well, so this is um, a watch that's very special to me. This is a Chopard Perpetual Calendar. Beautiful. Uh, with the retrograde date, a moon phase. Uh, and my wife I bought this as a gift. You know, we saw it together. Uh, and then she surprised me for my 30th birthday. Hmm. You know, and one day I hope it's something I could pass down to one of my sons. Um, but again, this, the perpetual calendar has always been one of the complications I've found most fascinating that completely through mechanical, you know, mechanisms, they can uh, engineer a watch that you can fit on your wrist that tells the exact date accounting for the months uh, and the leap years, you know, through 2100. I mean, it's unbelievable. And, and that so, thing was hiding beneath your dress cuff until yeah, I asked you about it. you would never see it. You never and, know, but it has all that at your disposal. It's yeah. And so what I love about this is, of course, and you probably know this, I mean, this was, you know, I don't know if it, you'd call it vintage, right? It's a 1990s watch. It's vintage now. You know, vintage now. Think, it's yeah, to think know, about right? it. That's vintage. But it was made on a, a Jaeger Le Coutier uh, Ubosch, right? So like the base movement mm -hmm. wasn't Cartier. They modified it. And so this I bought at a, you know, at a vintage watch store for like, you know, a steal, right? And so again, like there is accessibility here within the world of mechanical watches that does not require one to spend sixty thousand dollars to have a timepiece uh, in which one can be proud. That's right, and so, it's an aspirational game, just yeah. like life. Yeah, so, that's right. You're always upgrading. So, um, so here we are. So this is an incredible collection of watches, mm -hmm. and so I think. I mean, I don't know how we we start, but I think I you can know, kick us off. Let's just start. You know. I'll, I'll, I'll defer to you. So yeah. there's a few places, like people ask, you know, where do I begin with watches? Yeah. And I, I wanted to take on the theme of, okay, what would maybe a Kirby Allison viewer be interested yeah. in? Because there's a level of, you know, the classic gentleman mm -hmm. that I think is obviously here. So I wanted to start with a couple pieces. One is a watch from a brand Timex that most people are probably going to be familiar with. Uh, now this brand has gone through many different ups and downs over the years. They started as the Waterbury Watch Company in the 1800s, uh, 1854. And they started to be more of that brand that had that slogan of uh, well, take a licking but keeps on ticking, mm -hmm. more of you know, mass market in terms of what it's going for. But in 2017, they released this watch. This is one of the Timex Marlin. So this is a reissue of a 1960s design. But a couple wow. things why this watch is interesting. One is the price. I mean, mm -hmm. $200, still a good chunk of money, but you're getting a hand-wound watch. The other thing that does... Uh, what makes this watch interesting for me is retro design. It, it really lays into that 1960s mm -hmm. style. It's hand wound. And then also 34 millimeter case. Yeah. In 2017, right, we were coming. This is small. It's small. And especially in that era. Now we've started to see a return to form of yeah. watches starting to go back, but we were coming off this almost bling era of watches of the 2000s, yeah, like 2010. and like. Exactly. Yeah. To make that in 2017 is quite bold. Yeah. So 34 millimeter. $200 watch, classic in terms of its approach, dome, uh, plexiglass, crystal on top. Mm -hmm. Just yeah, simple, clean. Yeah. And elegant. And elegant. Yeah. I mean, this ultimately is the beauty of the timepiece is that, you know, is uh, in its simplicity, in many cases, is the beauty. Um, and that's what I like about some of the vintage stuff. Again, the timeless elegance of mm -hmm. proper proportions where, you know, the moment that we got to the 40s and 42s and plus watches, I feel like we kind of strayed from. So it's nice to see we're coming back. Um, that was one of the watches, I think, responsible in a way of starting to usher in that new trend of things going back mm -hmm. into that form. Yeah. And so a watch like this, uh, $200, I mean, is it 
stainless steel case. Stainless steel case. Would it be available in a gold metal if, you know? You're going to be dealing with more plating here. Plated, so yeah. that's what you're dealing with. Uh, but a not plated gold. gold like a uh, it would be more like a PVD. Okay. Like a PVD. Mm -hmm. for, so you have a stainless steel case. Uh, th that's how that would be yeah. uh, done. So that's, that's available there for $200. Another brand that I think is right there. Now, this has become a... It's kind of a cult classic in the past 10 okay. years for affordability. Like, this mm -hmm. is a gateway drug. This is one of them. <laughs> this is the yeah, Orient careful. Bambino. For all those people watching. Yeah, yes. This is... so, yes. But for watches. Here you yeah. are. That is the Orient Bambino at 38. Okay. So this is a Japanese brand. Mm -hmm. And they are known for just good value for money mechanical watches. Fully integrated as well. So the movement, oh, yeah. the watch it, it, the the it is actually available for you. Made, you know, in their facility. Mm. Uh, so... Japanese brand. They're actually underneath the Seiko Epson Corporation, so really? they're a Seiko offshoot brand. Okay. But they're a little bit more of a newer brand. They, mm -hmm. they started in the mid-20th century, but this is, in the last 10 years, the watch that really kind of put them more on the map in terms of collectors, just because it's $200, $250 for that watch. 38 millimeter case, that's a newer case variant, but you have so many different available dial options mm -hmm. for you that there is absolutely, like this, for so many, is that kicking off point of kind of getting that watch bug. Uh, if they like classic dress watches. Yeah. And so this is fully mechanical, self-winding. Fully mechanical. Right? What is the difference in a $200 mechanism or movement versus, say, you know, a Rolex or, a, you know, so, a Jaeger liqueur? Yeah. So Rolex is a very specific example because they are more of an industrialized movement. Mm -hmm. While you're buying a Rolex is more from the case finishing standpoint, yeah. of course, the brand, its heritage, and just this no-nonsense approach for delivering a luxury product. Mm -hmm. But if you're starting to get into more of a bespoke product yeah. uh, or a product that's more artisanally finished, mm -hmm. that's when you're starting to see it, it's not necessarily about the, is it more accurate? There is an mm -hmm. element to that. So you'll have different testing standards. So yeah. like chronometer testing, which mm -hmm. will allow accuracy between a specific period of, uh, say, a COSC certification, mm -hmm. minus four to plus six. Okay. That's usually a standard that you'll see. So that's one element. But really where watches are going to separate is from finishing of parts. Okay. So you'll have different finishes. Even um, you know with some of the watches here, we'll show each individual component is going to be finished rather than this. If you look at this movement, more utilitarian, more yeah. matte in its approach. But you look at some of these other watches, you might have a Cote de Genève finish on the top of the bridges, maybe mm -hmm. some anglage across the edge. So each of the edge of the bridge is going to be finished. Maybe some higher end materials, the uh, jewel layout, all, all of this, the array of the movement itself, that's really what you're looking at yep. when you start to go up. It's more of just the individual parts rather than the sum of its parts mm. that you're just putting together. Yeah. But functionally, they're effectively the same. Functionally, very, sim very similar. I mean, automatic watch, how it's powered, Automatic winding rotor, so you yeah. see this thing moving around, that oscillating weight, mm -hmm. winds up a mainspring, goes down a gear train, and then there's a thing called an escapement, which basically, as that mainspring is unwinding, is allowing a small amount of energy to be distributed. Most watches nowadays, if you look at like a pendulum on a grandfather clock, this is mm -hmm. a good way to put it, what is powering that watch is the back and forth of that pendulum, or an mm -hmm. oscillation, one yeah. back and forth movement. Mechanical watches nowadays typically will have back and forth movements of six to eight times per second. So when you hear the tick, 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 mm -hmm. that's what you're hearing. You're hearing that escapement yeah. and that mechanical time timekeeping happening yeah. there. That beating heart, it's alive. Exactly, so it really is a heart, yeah. it really is a heartbeat yeah. for the watch. Another brand, Seiko, okay. Japanese manufacturer. Japanese taking center stage here so far. <laughs> Japanese taking center stage so far, but they just produce, and if you look back in history in the 1960s, I mean, Seiko and just Japanese watchmaking basically pulled the rug out from underneath yeah. you know, the Swiss yeah. in many they ways. They sure did. And the industry, there's an era called the quartz crisis, yeah. where the Seiko well, The Japanese Astro invented the quartz movement, didn't they? It's Seiko yeah. Astro in 1969, yeah. and this was a period where mechanical watches, there was a lot of doubling down. This was new technology and Seiko just came in and just changed the way the industry was really going about. And uh, nowadays, mostly known for their mechanical watches from an enthusiast perspective, this is a watch known as the cocktail time. Okay. This is where I think you start to get into something even a little bit more special, mm -hmm. uh, from my opinion, just from a design standpoint. So these are all inspired by specific Japanese cocktails. It has its very nice rib finish. As you're starting to see as we're going up yeah. here, you can see the the dial itself is a little bit more, it has some character to it, but you also see the finishing of the mm -hmm. dial. It has a little bit more pop yeah. in terms of what it's bringing forth. Vertically integrated manufacturer, their movements, uh, their mainsprings, like they're making this in-house. That's why they're so remarkable. And you're talking about a watch for $400. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, yeah, and it's a, I mean, it's a beautiful watch. And then I would imagine, I mean, this is a patent 
band, but I mean, all these watches, you know, you can get them with different bands. You can get the quick releases and, yes. you know, that's a whole nother kind of world. All you need to do is know what your lug width is. So there's, that's the dimension yeah. you understand your lug width and you can get into some Buying nice leather straps. Yeah. yeah. And just find what you want. There's some great bespoke makers of, of leather goods that will yeah. make some great leather straps. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. This is, uh, you know, one from uh, Jean Rousseau. You know, yes. Paris. Yes. Paris you know, yes. Has yes. a little quick release mechanism integrated into the strap itself. And so I've got three or four straps that I'll even travel with. So if I'm wearing brown shoes, I can wear a brown strap. This is, you know, lizard, or I can wear a black crocodile strap, you know, without having to get the tools out. And that's the wonderful thing also about you know, getting a strap is it kind of allows you to have your watch have different lives, yeah. right? And you can get the feeling of a new watch mm -hmm. without actually getting having a new to watch. Have a new watch, yeah. Yeah. Um, so this is a little bit larger, right? Forty Slightly millimeter case. flashier, I would say. Slightly flashier, um, but still quite elegant and conservative. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Also. Swiss, okay. now we're shifting into. So this is a brand that, my first Swiss brand that I own is Tissot. Okay. So this is a Chemende Terrell. Now Tissot has been around since 1853. Mm -hmm. They're in the lock. Uh, Chemende Terrell references the address and where they're from. So, you know, it's very similar to what we see with other brands, yeah. but just a simple, beautiful, elegant wash. Yeah. Now a couple things that they're doing that you'll start to notice even as we're starting to get up here, maybe some things to call out and attention okay. to. Uh, the case itself, you're seeing some different mixing of finishes. Now, this is another element as you start to go up in the hierarchy of brands, mm -hmm. you'll notice. So you see brush finishes, and you'll see polished finishes on those side of the cases when typically what you're seeing on some of these first watches is more singular in its finishing. So that's mm -hmm. where you're starting to see someone is individually going in and polishing that case and then also brushing that case, which mm -hmm. is the two different uh, setup system for what wheel they're using when they're on the machine. Also, what you'll notice is some of the finer details, like the indices on that. So like the indexes for the hours, you'll notice that there's slight little variance in terms of how they're finished. The hands, mm -hmm. so you have that center facet in those hands. Mm -hmm. Then on, there's dual finishes on those hands. So one is gonna be more of like a blasted effect, mm -hmm. and then one's gonna be more polished. Yeah. So these are the fine details that you don't really notice. It's, it's like the same way if you're looking at the stitching on the yeah. side of a well. Right? Does it Only matter? If you're looking for it, do you see it? Do you Does it matter? No, yeah. but it, but it's the detail that is just you know, what you're yeah. noticing, and that's what somebody's paying yeah. for. So that's starting to get up closer to the thousand dollar mark. So yeah. that's around seven hundred dollars for that well, this watch. This is a beautiful watch for seven hundred dollars. It also, I mean, seems to have a, a certain degree of finesse to just even the case, the shape of the case, mm -hmm. right? I mean, smaller kind of tolerances. You know, I mean, there's, um, you know, I don't know. I mean, it just looks not as maybe bulky as, you know, something else. This also, I mean, you talked about, you know, what do you get as you start to go up? Yeah. Uh, another thing that I, I forgot to mention is power reserve. Okay. So when we're talking about that mainspring, mm -hmm. depending on, you know, how long the uh, power reserve is or how long the mainspring is, that will have an effect on the power reserve, which basically means that a full wind, how long will the watch run? Okay. This has an 80-hour power reserve okay. in comparison to some of these watches that are closer to the 40-hour power reserve. Okay. So basically dubbing, doubling yeah. up. Yeah, that's certainly... Uh, sufficient power reserve and that's I mean that's pretty up there in terms of mm -hmm. you know even what you'd find from a Rolex or something else is not pushing much yeah state. Rolex is more con I mean a lot of like you know Tudor Rolex I mean 70 is kind of that new standard yeah. like that's kind of that new threshold okay. in terms of like luxury so what they're doing here is we're talking about that frequency six to eight mm -hmm. beats per second what they do is they take a at a base caliber so 28,800 vibrations per hour and mm -hmm. slow the beat, beat frequency down to 21,600 vibrations per hour okay. to maximize that reserve of the mainspring. Okay. So it's almost so like energy. Does that affect the um, the accuracy of the watch? So high beats can, if you think about like a top, Yeah. if you think about a top on a on table, if it's spinning quick, quicker, mm -hmm. and you that could potentially throw off that oscillation. But what they do is now there's a different thing called a different, like a balance assembly. So mm -hmm. how the balance is constructed. Mm -hmm. If it has a traditional regulator pin setup, I don't want to get too nerdy here, yeah. but well, if <laughs> we're you're a good there. company. Yeah, good company, that's good. <laughs> that could uh, potentially ha cause these little pins to move that will uh, adjust the timekeeping. But if you have more of a free sprung bar balance architecture, which this has more of that type of structure, mm -hmm. it counteracts that. Okay. So in many of the movements that, you know, this is a Swatch Group brand, they, are, they actually own ETA. They have a lot of just research and development to make these movements work. Yeah. But you're, you're, you are right in terms of accuracy, high beat, because basically it's smaller distributions of energy, mm -hmm. the higher the beat frequency. Yeah. So it's just think about, hey, if you have more of less energy going, it's more consistent flow yeah. more frequently. Interesting. Yeah, because mm -hmm. there's a lot of watches out there. I mean, one of the complications are high frequency watches that mm -hmm. like, you know, beat really fast. Yes. Right. And you kind of see it in the hand also, right? I mean, like every click of the hand you know, is actually one of those beats. Exactly. Right? So versus like a, 
quartz watch where you might have 60 beats mm -hmm. a minute, right? right. Or, a, you know, on a watch like this, you would have, you know, how many, like, you know. S that would be six on that. Six, yes. Okay. Yeah. For a three hertz movement. Yeah. So that's what you're actually seeing. So most people, when they start to look at mechanical watch for the first time, one thing they'll notice right away is the sweeping second hand. That's what they will call yeah. that movement of that second hand. And really it looks like it's just an effortless movement yeah. going forward. But what you're actually seeing is six small, small little movements forward. Every second. Every second. Yeah. I remember with, you know, the first, my Rolex that my grandfather gave me. I mean, I used to think that the hand on a Rolex was just one continuous kind of movement because mm -hmm. right? I had no idea otherwise. Uh, then whenever I looked close, I actually saw that it was, you know, again, a bunch of small little movements every second. And again, it's that, you know, that finesse there that, uh, that makes that watch so much more interesting than what would initially meet the eye. One other before we uh, jump out of the more attainable end. So this is a smaller brand. This is known as Baltic. They're a okay. French company. They are, I would call them more of like a micro brand. So they are doing small production uh, and they're really leaning into just like very interesting design. Yeah. So this is their MR01. What is small production? I mean, what? So it depends on the brand. So if you talk about Philippe Dufour, I mean, he's made less than 50 watches his entire life. Yeah. If you talk about George Daniels, or, or, uh, you know, like these type of creators, yeah. I mean, it's very, very like low numbers. Uh, but but for if, a company like this, I mean, small production. I, you know, I, I, yeah, I would I mean, assume in the, in the, in the thousands, thousands, but you're also yeah. talking about watches that are $600. And what makes that watch special is it has a micro rotor movement. So we've looked at watches so far that have had a centrally mm -hmm. fixed rotor. Mm -hmm. This is more of a artisanal yeah. uh, attribute that you'll mm -hmm. see as you start to go up market. So it's almost off-centered, it's smaller. What brands utilize this for is typically with when you're dealing with thickness mm -hmm. and how you can you counteract that because if you add a rotor on top of a movement, it can add to yeah. the thickness. What this is case. allowing to do is keep it very svelte yeah. and find a way for that oscill or uh, the power reserve to be, yeah. um, the mainspring to be wound. Well, there's quite a, a degree of decoration and finishing of the movement mm -hmm. itself and you can see that through this you know, kind of skeleton back. Um, yeah, that's beautiful. Uh, and this again, it looks kind of slightly retro in terms of the design of the dial itself. The Arabic numerals, yeah. it's, it's very much returning to form and size too. I mean, mm -hmm. you're talking about 36 millimeters, I believe on that case. Yeah. And, uh, and I would imagine they have many different models, right? Yes. You know, all with kind of the same, you know, mechanical principles, but mm -hmm. in different, different actual designs. So maybe you're not into this, but they've got other models. Exactly. And that's pr pretty much the case for everything oh, that we've looked yeah. at so far. Yeah, that's great. And again, completely mechanical. And how much, you said this is less than $1,000? That's less than $1,000. So I wanted to start there because I, I think it's important everybody should be able to get a cool watch. Yeah. And just the way that you're talking about, you know, Allen Edmonds, yeah. Park, Park yeah. Avenues, yeah. right? Start there, start but somewhere. then... You know, Take maybe. care of them and, you know, you don't... I think that, again, you know, I mean, I've got a massive shoe collection. I'm sure you have a massive watch collection, but it doesn't have to be like that. I mean, you know, if you've got three nice pairs of shoes, I mean, you could have everything covered. And so with watches, I mean... It's like buy one nice timepiece, right? And however much that you is, right? Afford. If it's a two hundred dollar piece or mm -hmm. an eight hundred dollar piece or a thousand dollar piece, you know, just one nice timepiece, right? It is one of those subtle signals that whenever you are, you know, presenting yourself, mm -hmm. you know, just like a nice pair of well shined shoes and a nice tie knot and a jacket and clothing that fits. I mean, you know, people often look at the timepieces, you know, kind of a signal. It's true. It's very true. So where do we want to go next? I, I have a couple more, and then we can kind of start to get, getting into. So I think this really will also, yeah. yeah. So let's do a couple other pieces here, and then we can jump up to. Some I mean, these more. are all new watches to me, so I mean, it's, yeah, it's oh, really right. fascinating yeah. to see. I these. don't know yeah. what flow you go. I can go yeah. spend here all day doing yeah, this. Well, but, I mean, yeah. it's whatever. Uh, I'm following your lead. So this is a. Um, let's actually go here next. So this is a little bit of a different style compared to what we've seen so far. This is a brand called. Junghans. So they're a German brand. It's the only German brand on the table. So I figured okay. I'd show a little bit of a different approach. Mm -hmm. Now Junghans is it looks more very German. This watch, very <laughs> German. Yes. So that design comes from a designer known as Max Bill. Okay. Max Bill was a student of the uh, Bauhaus School of Design okay. uh, from Germany. Which there's a chance that somebody watching this right now is being influenced by that design house because Apple products really yeah. comes from that you know lineage of okay. um, design. of design. But this was a watch that was created after they went to Max Bill and they first actually commissioned him to make them a wall clock. It was a kitchen clock. Okay. And it was a good success. Then they shifted into, hey, let's make a wristwatch. Mm -hmm. So this is almost an adaption of that original design into a wristwatch. And a couple of the things that uh, why I like this watch so much is its simplicity. There's a purity to it. The typography for the yeah. numerals is very unique. 
I, it's a, a museum of modern art type of watch, mid 20th century approach in terms of what it's going for. You have a curvature of a dial mm -hmm. that almost slips back. It, it has this feeling as if it is just something that is on the wall. Yeah. Like it's almost popping out at you, which yeah. I, I think is very cool with the curvature of the crystal. It has like no border. It almost disappears mm -hmm. kind of onto the wrist, I would imagine. The new, yeah, because there's almost no bezel, yeah. right? So like a way to look at it too is like that dial to bezel ratio. Mm -hmm. It's just all dial. Yeah, Very similar dial. to a clock, yeah. right? Where you see it on the wall, it's all about legibility mm -hmm. and being as large as possible, but it's still small. It's 38 millimeters. Yeah, this is a gorgeous watch. And again, mechanical with a beautiful sweeping hand. I mean, look at the seconds hand. It's, you know? And it's just over $1,000. It's not absurd in terms of as you're starting to climb the ladder. Mm -hmm. And it's automatic, right? So it's a automatic. mechanical exactly. watch with an automatic winder. So again, you're not having to sit there and Wind. Were any of these mechanical? Mechanically so wound? the first one you saw was manual wind. Okay. Manual wind. So you'd have to actually wind that manually. And what's the power reserve on that? How it's right around 40 hours. Okay. Right so around you're 40 winding hours. it. You know, yeah. once, uh, you know, yeah, once a day a and a half, yeah. right? So. Yeah. So, you know, if you're wearing it, you wind it. Right? But that's the perks of an automatic wash. Yeah. If you're wearing it, then it's yeah, winding it itself wind. with your own motion. Yeah. With that movement or that rotor. Yeah. I mean, it's such an interesting uh, variety here, right? Mm -hmm. Of house styles, if you will. Yes. Um, Couple. What you see in tailoring, which is fascinating. I mean, yeah, I mean, do, do you see a lot of, because I mean, you don't talk about watches that much on your channel. I mean, do you see a lot of parallels with this type of? Yeah, I mean, we'd love to do more watch content yeah. because that's, a, I mean, it is such a component of a gentleman's lifestyle. I mean, a well-dressed gentleman, you know, should be wearing a nice timepiece, right? And he doesn't need a paddock, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I don't own one. I aspire to one one day, maybe. And he doesn't need, you know, 15 watches, but one nice, thoughtful, you know, well-crafted, uh, beautiful piece is enough for a man to have. And it's one of the few pieces of jewelry, I mean, outside cufflinks, really, mm -hmm. you know, that True. a man will ever wear. And so, you know, being deliberate and thoughtful and having that, you know, kind of be a part of, you know, kind of how you, you dress is important. A couple others, and then we'll get into some more out there type of thing. Okay. We can start to show the yeah. ascension. We have alarms here. We have uh, something really fun on my wrist and then some other things that yeah. I think people will Because we like. really haven't gotten into complications here. I mean, this no. compared to your average watch mm -hmm. is mechanical and self-winding. Mm -hmm. So those, I guess, I don't know if you'd call those complications, but they're kind of your 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 ante, if you will. Yes. You know, your buy-in to a nice classic piece. Complication um, is anything that other than telling the time. Telling the time, yeah. So, for example, a date. A date, okay. Now, a date window is the common way a date yeah. is sh shown, but we'll use that as a segue to show a different way to show a date, how it's shown. This is a pointer date. Okay. So this is from a brand called Oris. They've had this design in their family since 1938. And the difference here of how this is being able to showcase that is instead of having a date window with an open aperture mm -hmm. with a date wheel underneath, they have an additional hand with the date, all the days of the month on yeah. the outskirts, that then will be indicated one by that. 1 through 31. 1 through yeah. 31. Simple as that. This yeah. is more of a romantic complication as you start to ascend up in price, typically associated with high horology, like very okay. luxury makers, more bespoke makers and, and watchmakers. So that's something you would traditionally find on an entry level model. No. That, that's starting to get to two thousand dollars. So you yeah. know you're starting to spend a little bit more money mm -hmm. there to get into a watch like that. Now Oris yeah. is an independent brand, a Swiss brand, founded in the early twentieth yeah. century, but make a great watch. One of the few independent brands in the industry left because it's very much become a... So consolidated. Yes, yeah, so yeah. consolidated, the different luxury groups. Mm -hmm. So that, that's a unique presence to have. Yeah, and I like the burgundy dial, right? I mean, that's... It's sharp. You know, well, maybe... Like an ox blood. You know, it might not be your only watch because it's a very kind of mm -hmm. striking burgundy, but, um, you know, it's very beautiful. Yeah. Calling attention to something else, too. You might find this interesting. So you look at those numerals. So this is a brand Longines. Mm -hmm. If you're... Discussing one of the most historically important brands in watchmaking, this ha absolutely has to be it. Okay. Started in 1832, 190 plus years of history. I mean, they're incredible. Uh, they have been watchmakers for F1 in their timekeeping. Also, still to this day, the Kentucky Derby. Okay. Uh, they're still the, the official timekeeper. Huh. They were the first brand to have two time zones on one watch. The first brand to have a chronograph on a watch. Flyback. Uh, first brand to have for a chronograph, which is basically a stopwatch and a watch, mm -hmm. have two pushers. Okay. Uh, they're a remarkable brand. Now, this is a watch I just want to bring attention to because it does something very unique with its numerals. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's two things that also will call attention to in terms of going the extra mile. Okay. One is the engraving of those numerals. So mm -hmm. what we've seen so far are numerals that are more like raised or applied, as we'll call it, if they're actually affixed to the mm -hmm. dial. This is more engraved. So you'll see that that's, it's machine finished to have those engraved recessed areas for those numerals for the hours. Yeah. So it's 
pretty striking. Well, it gives great dimensionality to mm-hmm. this dial, right? I mean, as you kind of rotate it, you see, you know, dimension. Yes. And uh, I mean, the way that it catches the light, right? You know, mm-hmm. striking. And so that's a beautiful detail. Again, very subtle. Yes. Right? But whenever you look at it, you say, oh, yeah, that is really well done. It's a beautiful watch. And then also the bluing of the hands is okay. another technique you'll see as you start mm-hmm. to ascend up. Now, this is actually being done uh, in many watches that you start to get up through heat treatment. Okay. So they'll actually put this over fire in an oven and they mm-hmm. have to heat it at the right moment where it turns blue. This is for an aesthetic purpose, but also from a purpose of making sure that there's not going to be any deterioration of that. So it actually fortifies and hardens the okay. hands themselves. What type of metal is the hand made from? Uh, I believe those would be steel. Steel, for those. okay. So the steel, I mean, mm-hmm. wow, that's amazing. I mean, it's again, a very vibrant blue color. That's beautiful, right? And so uh, this particular brand, I mean, s- historic Swiss brand. Yes. Uh, this watch, how much does this run for? That's, that's a little over $2,000. Okay. You're now in that $2,500 range for a yeah. watch like that. But what does a watch from Lanmire, you know, top out at? I mean, for Longines. For Longines, sorry. They're more in that two to four, five thousand dollar range okay. is usually where they sit. So this is more kind of towards the entry level for yeah. them. But they're doing some incredible things. I mean, a brand to truly investigate if you also want to look at classic dress watches, yeah. uh, GMT watches, mm-hmm. Pilots watches. They have yeah. remarkable history, like Charles Lindbergh. Uh, Commission Longines, they produced a watch for him to actually do these transatlantic flights. Okay. Uh, it's called the Hour Angle Watch. Okay. Remarkable history of this brand. Yeah, well, you, I mean, whenever you, you said 190 plus years mm-hmm. kind of Swiss heritage brand, I would have suspected that, you know, their upper end would have been much more expensive than just, you know, a few thousand dollars, which is, again, quite approachable from kind of a Swiss heritage brand is concerned. Some of the best value in all watchmaking, as yeah. far as I'm concerned. Yeah, and beautiful engraving. I mean, like, you can really mm-hmm. see it engraved into the dial. Mm-hmm. Wow, that's beautiful. great. Wow. So I have a few more left. Okay. That's now this like this progressively is progressively interesting. Yeah, this is, so this is where we got also get to talk about power reserve a little bit more. So okay. this is from Bauman Mercier. So Bauman Mercier, they were founded in 1830. Mm-hmm. I believe they're the sixth oldest active operation brand in all of watchmaking. Really? Which I, I when I learned that, I'm like, wow, that's because you yeah. don't hear about this brand. So it's part of uh, the Richemont Group, who own brands like JLC, mm-hmm. Cartier, uh, Vacheron, Constantin, like yeah, some yeah. some amazing brands. Mm-hmm. Uh, but this is more of their. You know, right on three thousand dollars. This is known as our Clifton Bombatic. Now, what's special about this watch is the movement on the inside. So, this is a class-leading movement for the price category. Okay. You're dealing with a five-day power reserve, 120, you know, 20 hour power reserve. It's also going to be nice machine finishing. So you see those spiral pattern yeah. with the perlas, different finishing on the bridges, the uh, mm-hmm. rotor. You're starting to see some of those higher end finishing techniques yeah. here. Uh, on display, as you saw with Longines as well, but this is where you start to get in that tier. And talk yeah. about power reserve. Uh, you know, we we're looking at 80 hours here now, yeah. 120. So this yeah. is yeah. as you're starting to go up. This is where the technical function comes into play. Yeah, absolutely. This is a beautifully finished, and again, it's got that sapphire crystal back, right? So you can mm-hmm. actually see and exactly. appreciate, you know, the work that goes into it. And what I love about it is, if you look close enough, you can actually see it, you know, kind of beating, mm-hmm. you know, the actual. You know, kind of escape movement. So, yeah, and you see the balance wheel just going yeah. back and forth. Basically acting like that pendulum. Yeah, It's going absolutely. back and forth, back and forth, swinging back and forth. And this one has a second hand, right? So it does have a second hand. Sweeping. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What are your thoughts on watches with or without second hand? I mean, does that, do you have an, like, is that an, do you have an opinion on that or is it just a, merely a matter of kind of personal preference? I think it's personal preference and it also depends on the brand. Like Cartier has some of those beautiful watches and they don't have second hands. Yeah. Uh, a brand that I love is Parmigiani Florier. Their, okay. uh, their, some of their watches don't have a second hand, mm-hmm. and I think it works. It just has to fit in with the brand's DNA. DNA those. Yeah. So it just depends. Uh, also, people do like the romantic idea of seeing the second hand sweep to remind them that it is a mechanical watch, that they are looking at a mechanical watch, yeah. but it really just depends on what your preference is. Yeah. yeah, interesting. Yeah, that's a beautiful watch. And again, you know, a few thousand dollars is like not what mm-hmm. you would expect. Yeah, three thousand dollars. Yeah. Should we look at some more fun yeah, things here? Yeah, let's keep on going. Okay. I mean, this is like. I love show and tell. I think you'll like this one. So when people think of the president's watch, they think of probably the Rolex day date. Mm-hmm. That is typically associated yeah. many presidents in the 20th yeah. century wore it. But another watch that is also given that name is a watch that I have here. Okay. This is from a brand, Volcane. Okay. So old Swiss brand, but they produced a watch known as the Volcane Cricket in 1947. Why it was special was it was the first mechanical alarm watch to really take off. There were other attempts of it earlier, but this was the one that stayed. Really? Okay, so even like before like a paddock, which 
Yeah, 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 for an actual alarm. I mean, there's yeah. been like chiming watches, yeah. but this is more of an alarm. An alarm. I'll, I'll play it for people so they yeah. get a sense in a bit. But in 1953, uh, Truman was actually gifted one of these watches uh, by the photographer, White, Ho uh, White House Photographers Association. Okay. And he wore it. He liked it a lot. And then it became this tradition where it was gifted to presidents. Uh, LBJ apparently loved them so much that he gifted 200 of them Did to he really? people. It was like his, his <laughs> gift to different people he yeah. liked. But this watch was then brought back, uh, several different ownership, quartz crisis, had fell on tough times, yeah. but it's now totally been reinvigorated in terms okay. of its life. And 36 millimeters, but why it's special is an alarm function. So what you can do is it has an additional hand to set your alarm. And people would use this as an alarm clock back in the day. So here, let me actually... So before we, you had your iPhone. To before you had your it. iPhone. So what you do is there's actually, we talked about the mainspring barrel. Mm -hmm. This one has two. So two power sources. Okay. One for mechanical timekeeping, mm -hmm. the other to power the alarm. Okay. So what you have to do is you wind in one direction and you wind in the other direction. The other. Okay. To is have this both a mechanical? Like it's not fully mechanical. Another. Fully mechanical. Okay. And then when you pull this out and you go right where that fourth hand is. And you can feel it. Wow. And you can feel it ringing. Yeah, that'd probably wake me up, to be honest. It would. And how long does it ring for? It's around 15, 20 seconds. Yeah. But it depends on how, if it's on a full line, around 20 seconds. You yeah. can see there. I mean, yeah, roughly. that's a long, that's longer than I expected. <laughs> wow, that's, that's fascinating. That'd be an interesting test to see if that would actually wake you up, but otherwise. I um, tried it, it actually did. Yeah, it did, yeah. yeah I mean, you know, the vibrating probably would do it more than the noise. And when you feel it on your hand, I mean, it will. I bet. It, it, the it gyrates. And, cricket. This is yeah. a cool watch. Yeah. And for four thousand dollars, you get a watch like that. And, and one of the, I mean, you're talking about alarm. This is where you're getting into complication, mm -hmm. right? So an alarm is typically associated, yeah, higher end. Uh, another famous example is with JLC. They're a memo box. I'd say mm -hmm. that's the second pillar of like okay. alarm watches. But uh, this is an undisputed, uh, you know, leader in that field yeah. in terms of alarm watches, but not very well known by those maybe outside. And it's a it. beautiful case. Right, I mean, 36? Right 36, they have a couple different dial colors. Yeah. You also have a 39 millimeter option. This very talented like young gentleman uh, revived it and brought it back. Where and, is it based out of? Uh, well, they're Swiss made watches now. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. And then what does this button right here do? So what that does is that pusher, what it'll do is allow you to activate the alarm hand. So you can set your alarm. Uh, so you push okay. that out, pop, pop the crown out, and then you can adjust hmm. appropriate time. Make sure you wind it. There you go. In your business. There, that's, uh, that's a cool watch. I may have to look into finding one of those. I had a feeling you'd like that yeah, one. I wanted to this bring one, that. This one's neat. I like that a lot. It's a beautiful <laughs> salmon dial, too. I mean, what color is that? It's like Yeah, salmon, salmon copper, yeah. I mean, whatever you would like to call it. Champagne. Yeah. I mean, every brand has their different Yeah, I mean, I like it. it. I mean, that's like, it's nice. Nice right. strap, too. It's yeah. a lot of fun. There you go. That's a cool watch. Yeah, it'll get your attention. Sure yeah. will. That's a nice cocktail piece. Yeah, cocktail conversation. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think I, Kirby might need to get one of these. I know. I'm so, put that on my Christmas list. Um, <laughs> well, what more. else? I mean, we've got I have two more. Okay, only two. I gosh, I'm surprised we've covered this much ground already. So I adore this brand. This is mm -hmm. Omega. In terms of mass market luxury brands that just do it right, I think this is absolutely like a, just a leader. Mm -hmm. This is known as their Globe Master. So okay. this is a watch that I personally own. I love it. It's special for a few reasons. Now, the Constellation family is well regarded for Omega. It's been around since the early 1950s. Mm -hmm. That design came out in 2015, and it returns to form in a few different ways. Number one, it has a pie pan dial, which basically refers to the dial and how it's raised at the center and the mm -hmm. recessed areas at the outskirts, so made to look yeah. like a pie pan. Okay. The other element that is cool about this watch is the bezel. So you see the shiny fluted bezel. Mm -hmm. Now there's aesthetics to that, but there's also a function to that and also durability aspect that needs to be talked about. So that is made of tungsten carbide, which is usually used okay. for military weapons. Oh, really? And okay. the hardness of that is around, oh, it's over 2,000 Vickers. And for context, stainless steel, which you know we use for a lot of industrial products, yeah. is around 150 to 200 untreated. No so so that is, is really just, hard. Just below diamond yeah. in terms of the, on the hardness scale. So if you need to break a window, like... You yes. Know, oh, yeah. And if you hit that on a door ha handle, I mean, look out for yeah. that door handle. Wow. It's very robust. And then the movement on the inside. So this is the first watch from Omega to showcase their Meta certified, uh, certification for their movements, mm -hmm. which 
was a testing standard that went beyond the COSC test, which tests the movement for accuracy, the chronometer testing. This is testing up the full cased up watch and is available to have magnetism uh, resistance up to 15,000 Gauss and MRI machines around that. So you can literally walk into an, M, you know, for an MRI and wear that watch yeah. and not have a deal. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's crazy. Watch it go flying across the room, but. Yeah. Uh, it's crazy. So yeah. then you also have accuracy of zero to plus uh, five seconds a day. Uh, you're dealing also with, uh, you know, water resistance testing, yeah. all these different testing standards that are being mm -hmm. done with this watch fully cased up. Uh, and the chronometer or the uh, case back has mm -hmm. these small little stars. It has this observatory chronometer. Mm -hmm. Back in the day for Switzerland, being an observatory chronometer is where a lot of these tests would take place. Yeah. And that was a high regard in terms yeah. of accuracy. That, standard, was, that yeah. was the peak. Uh, so those stars indicate their wins at the chronometer trials uh, back <laughs> in the day. So it's a small little detail. But I'm a big fan of the Constellation collection yep. and uh, just what it brings forth. It's uh, a beautiful watch. Yeah, it really is. And this has a... Um, you know, metal band, yes. right? And so it's slightly, I guess you'd say, sportier watch. You could, right? yeah. If you have it on that, you can easily take it off, put it on a leather strap. That's it's whatever you prefer. Yeah. I usually wear it under the bracelet. It just feels a little bit. Yeah, it's got a nice kind of weight to, weight it, to it for yeah. sure. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, this is a gorgeous. It's uh, yeah, it's interesting the, you know, just the, uh, you know, you know, kind of the intersection between astrology and timekeeping. Yes. Because you know, with navigation, right? I mean, mm -hmm. watches you know, were in a lot of ways invented, or a lot of the development in watchmaking was to allow for navigation, yes. celestial navigation and figuring out the longitudes. Precise. Right, which you had to know what mm -hmm. time it was, you know, relative to some reference point. And there was a big, you know, what was the book written about this? You probably know off the top of your head. I can't remember it, but there was, uh, you know, what was it in like the 19th century or 18th century where there sure. was a massive competition in order to create a self-contained movement that was accurate within a certain amount of time that could be carried onto a ship. So the complication is usually the equation of time. Yeah. Is like the complication because it'll tell you the actual time in relation to the actual uh, stars in mm -hmm. position. Like an equation of time and the weird thing is like a day for us versus what a day for the universe is yeah. in, in the stars above us, mm -hmm. it's a different thing. Yeah. So that's actually usually within about 15 minutes of each other every day. And you need to know that if you're you know calculating coordinates. So say you're in the 1800s, like Breguet, for example, was a pioneer of you know equation of time complication. Mm -hmm. So that if you're on a ship, to be able to navigate these waters, like, yeah, you need that. You need the ability to be able to figure out your longitude. Uh, you know, because it was impossible to do. It was impossible, like until you know the invention of accurate timekeeping. Mm -hmm. Precisely. Right. Um, and I think there was a big competition between the astrologers who were mm -hmm. trying to do it, you know, through the observation of the stars, and then you know horology trying to do it through timepieces. Right, and timepieces ultimately one out. You know, we have a uh, watch yeah. that has a little reference to okay. celestial bodies. Well, here we are. This is we're getting to the grand finale, yes. the big reveal. Yes. Ooh, so, look at that. You're bringing the the heavy guns today. So this you know? is a brand we've been referencing them, JLC or yeah. JJ Lecoultre. This is a Swiss brand out of um, really, I would say, uh, like the pinnacle of in terms of like artisanal watchmaking, mm -hmm. the Valley du Jou. Yeah. Uh, beautiful area of Switzerland. Usually see it's seated you know high up in like the hill the mountains it's, exactly it's what you'd stunning. expect yeah uh, I was fortunate enough to visit this manufacturer they've they've been around for you know, 190 yeah. years so do you have a video do you film a video there yes okay. I did I had to watch that the important thing to know about JLC is they are typically associated and given the name the watchmaker's watchmaker because you were referencing you know the movement production of using the Bosch movement mm -hmm. JLC. They've produced over 1,300 calibers in wow. their history. Yeah. They've produced for the likes of Patek Philippe, JLC, or uh, Vacheron, um, mm -hmm. AP, and many others. Yeah. They are an incredible brand. This is, I would say, the watch right. that they're yeah. most known for. Yeah. That is Reverso. a reverse. Yeah. So that is specifically a tribute calendar. And it also has a special thing because it's a duo face. Now, That's the Reverso so was produced originally in 1931 as a watch for polo players. Yeah. And the intention was that they wanted to wear a watch, but they didn't want the glass to shatter. And this was back in the day where you know the, they were using true glass, yeah. and they were using Before sapphire here, sapphire and, and it would yeah. shatter. So they needed some way to protect the watch, and back then apparently they, didn't, they needed to have it on their wrist. Yeah, of course, that they wouldn't couldn't take be it off. Yeah. They couldn't take it off. So what they created was a flipping case. Yeah. So if you push on the non-crown side, yeah. if you just push on it, boom and boom. 
Now, typically it's stainless steel yeah. or the gold traditional or metal or gold yeah. or whatever you would like to uh, have the case be made of. But in this case, this is a duo face. So they first did this in 1994, but it's That's a whole beautiful. another watch dial on the opposite side. So for this watch, you're dealing with a case that has over 50 parts, just the case alone. The movement is close to 300 components no on kidding. the inside. Wow. Uh, full gold. Uh, but I, I just love the Look duo face. The, it's it's one of the, the cool design of this back. Yes, it's one of the coolest complications or one of the coolest uh, approaches to creating conversation in watches, yeah. in my opinion. Well, and in addition to the two faces, it's it's a complicated watch. In addition to that, I mean, it's mm -hmm. got the the day, you know, mm -hmm. the month. Yep. Right. The date. Moon phase, as we were the moon starting, phase. starting to reference. Yes. Um, and so, does it function? I mean, you know, walk me through that. It's a beautiful watch. That's. Another one of those kind of holy grail watches. What I love about uh, a Reverso, of course, is it has a, a very iconic shape mm -hmm. that, you know, from across the room, you can immediately identify a Reverso by this kind of book, you know, shaped like a book. Yep, rectangular know. shape. It's, it's stunning. So how this basically works is you have your additional crown, so that's going to, to adjust your central hours. Mm -hmm. uh, you also have these pushers on the side, which will adjust your calendar functions. Okay. So you have about three different pushers. And is this an annual tool. calendar? Or this is, is a calendar. calendar. So you'll have to adjust it for different months of the yeah. year, depending on if it's a 30-day month or a 31-day month. So yeah. your perpetual will run yeah. indefinitely. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is just a calendar. Uh, but th this central side will have many of your calendar components. But the other cool thing about this is on the rever uh, reverse side, you have... 12 hours, so what you can do here is actually track an additional time zone. So at the top, it's actually hidden, but there's this little trigger. Okay. And what that will do is allow you to isolate the hour hand on this reverse mm -hmm. side of the duo phase. And what you could do here is say you're traveling and you have family here in Dallas, but you wanted to travel to New York. You leave it on your home time mm -hmm. here potentially, and then you could have your time yeah. for you know, without having to readjust. Local. Yes, simple yeah. as that. Hmm. And you beautiful. can quickly go back and forth. And then you also have an AM PM indicator at the bottom with that exposed aperture. I love this rose gold. Is that rose stunning. gold? Yeah, it's like a pink rose pink gold. Rose, yes. yeah. yeah, it's, it's this stunning. This is gorgeous. Wow. And it's got a quick release strap. Um, this is an interesting, it looks like a Chrome XL almost. So, you know, like an oiled leather. Yeah, it, it's, it is like a Chrome XL, very natural leather, but. The cool little detail there is that's actually produced and it's um, by an Argentinian uh, leather producer of polo boots. So that's the connection yeah, that where sense. the inspiration comes yeah. from. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course, you know, GLC very intimately, you know, kind of associated with polo. This is a gorgeous, I mean, this is a, you know, holy grail. So this is the top end then. And so for just you know, today, for today. So this is, you know, we went from $200. I mean, where do you end up at? And even for uh, reverse, so this is, a pretty advanced model. I mean, this a little is, bit more advanced, yeah, yes, because I mean, you're dealing with calendar and it's precious metal. Yeah, so because you can get a reverso for under twenty grand. I mean, you can get yeah. a reverso for under ten thousand. Can you really? Okay. Yes, you can. I didn't realize so. that you could. Mm -hmm. you know, that was that approachable, mm -hmm. I suppose. Um, but this has got the two dials. It's the a solid, you know, rose gold case. Mm -hmm. I think you're around twenty six, if I'm not mistaken, on that. But yeah, sounds reasonable. You know, it's see, this is, watch, this is what yeah. I was talking about. Where you talk <laughs> about where it, it's absurd, but as you start yeah. to get into this world, you. I think you get fascinated about how engaging and cool this is. Oh, you get this lost is a in it. Gorgeous timepiece. Wow. Oh, take it away from me. You okay? I mean, you can, you can spend more time with it. Yeah, it's all right. It doesn't bite. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, it's uh, yeah. We get a bit too, true watching thee right there. Um, and again, like you, Matt, you could dress it in so many different ways with mm -hmm. the different straps. Yep. But that is a watch that you know again speaks to the timeless elegance. I mean, you could, you know, fifty years from now, right? I mean, that watch would be just as stunning. You know, as as it is right now, as it has been for you know the hundred years that it's existed. Yep, exactly. Um, so I mean, we, we again, this is a small mm -hmm. kind of collection, approachable watches, really kind of entry level. Uh, but talk to me a little bit about kind of you know your just uh, viewpoint on the complications. I mean, this is where I think you really get into you know high horology, right? Like the haute couture of watchmaking, uh, where the watchmakers really show off and showcase. You know the technical expertise. I mean that real, uh, per, you know, scientific precision that exists at the high end of watchmaking. You know, talk me through some of the complications that, you know, that you just, you know, I don't know, are just enamored by, and, and why. 
You know, I think one is obviously the most romantic is something like a repeater yeah. where you're dealing with chimes that tell the time. Mm -hmm. And this was something that was really adapted for pocket watches. I mean, this is one that's held in very high regard. It's beautiful. There's like the tuning I was at, you know, specifically this brand, they mm -hmm. uh, have a Westminster and you're able to, for them, like it's almost like tuning. Yeah. Like if you're like you're tuning a guitar or turning, mm -hmm. or tuning a fine instrument just to get the right chime, mm -hmm. think about the case. Uh, you can also look at a brand like FP Journe, one of my favorite complications. And honestly, it's almost just an act of watchmaking. I don't even know if you could really call it that, but it's a phenomenon known as resonance. Yeah, okay. And what it does is it has two opposing balance wheels and they become in perfect synchronicity with one yeah. another okay. after being close in the vibrations yeah. and they come in perfect sync. Uh, you have a tourbillon, which was invented by Abraham Louis Breguet in uh, 1801, patented by him. And that is essentially reversing the for pocket watches where you'd have positional air because it would be in your pocket all day mm -hmm. it was created to put that entire balance assembly on an escapement or on a on a rotating cage so yeah. that it would be able to go against the, the counteract the position of balance yes or the impacts of gravity gravity is precisely right so there, yeah. there's a lot to get lost in in terms of complications yeah. and just ways that how brands are being creative and watchmakers because now it's it's reached this point if you look at this watches in general in the last decade or so, what's happened is a lot of the more, I would say, mass market product under $1,000, mm -hmm. it's still there, but in terms of Swiss, like the Swiss production and uh, exports, yeah. it's it has decreased. Mm -hmm. But what is interesting is things have now started to go up market, and there's yeah. almost this moat around this fine watchmaking. Yeah. And there's been a lot of interest. And honestly, you could argue that for like a brand like Rolex, they're as big now as they've ever been, yeah, which is remarkable to think about. A brand that's been around for well over a century now is 30% of the Swiss watch industry. It's crazy. And it, it's crazy to think about. Patek Philippe is in incredible shape. Yeah. AP is as large as it's ever yeah. been. It, it's it's remarkable to see what's happened with just the collecting fervor and just the yeah. enthusiasts and the auction market. Hopefully it and, calms down a little bit for those of us who... Yes, you know, it is. But I think it has gone a little bit uh, you yes. know, out of control. But, it has. Um, but what, what would you say is the kind of the cutting edge right now? I mean, because you speak in the last 10 or 15 years, I mean, one of the things that I saw was the in-house movements. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, like with this timepiece, you know, you know, uh, GLC or uh, Jaeger Le Coutier would do mm -hmm. the Ubosh, that movement mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. which Chopard then would build it out. You know, now you really don't see that. Now everyone is kind of marketing, you know, their in-house movements, right? Of doing everything in-house, having that provenance, you know, and Savile Row, I guess it would be called kind of the... Um, you know, the pure bespoke where the entire garment is mm -hmm. made on Savile Row, on premise, mm -hmm. right? Versus kind of being sent out. You know, I've seen that. Uh, but what else? I mean, is there, you know, kind of, you know, making people excited in, in this particular world? I think what's happened in the last five to 10 years, the biggest explosion has been these independent artisans. Okay. Because what's happened is many of the larger groups have... Mm -hmm started to shift into more of the hype culture and what is yeah. popular and forgetting about what a luxury experience should be. Mm -hmm. So if you want something that's truly a luxury product nowadays, yeah. you're going to these smaller houses that okay. are producing smaller batches. Like that's where you're seeing a big explosion. Uh, the biggest success stories in watches in the past 20 years have been these independent yeah, brands. Okay. So th that's really where I think a lot of things are going as we're going yeah. ahead because brands are they're gradually getting a little bit more specific in their approach, especially that luxury tier. Mm -hmm that now if somebody is very into watches, but they still want that luxury experience of mm -hmm. being able to interact with a maker, yeah. the same way if you know, you're getting a bespoke suit, yeah. that exists in watches. You can, okay. you can absolutely get it. It's just these smaller makers, you do have to wait, but yeah. uh, that's well, what's really been happening. All things for, are worth you know, all things waiting worth, for. Yes, exactly. You know, mm -hmm. uh, that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, I mean because you know, back in the day, I mean, you'd go to Paddock and you could actually commission a watch. Right? Sure. You could tell them how you wanted it made. I mean, the grave, super complicated watch. You know, I mean, that was a commission. He said that this is what I want. And they spent years making it, mm -hmm. you know, but now you go to Paddock and, you know, they'd say, well, you know, put your name on the list or, you know, have you, yes. how many watches have you purchased from us, you mm -hmm. know, and, you know, you need to be interviewed by five people, you know, before you're allowed to acquire something, which is great. I mean, it keeps the, you know, exclusivity of the product, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, in some ways you kind of lose that influence, if you will. And you're talking about a brand with Patek Philippe, they produce, I mean, we don't know, they're a private organization, yeah. but potentially over 50,000 watches a year, maybe more. Yeah, which is amazing. Which is a that. lot, especially for the caliber of watch they're producing, but you're one, you're a number. But yeah. just like if you walk on a university campus yeah. and you know, say you're going to 
yeah. University, University of Texas. Of Texas. Yeah, yeah. people. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of people. You're just yeah. one, or in, compared to a small yeah. college. I mean, that would you know, change the way you're being seen, and also the relationship you can have with the yeah. people that are involved in the process. Okay. Uh, any independence that you you know find particularly yeah. worth noting? You know, the challenge is you know you say so these many. names and then you just don't. Yeah. It's such a challenge to get them. Um, some that come up, F.P. Jorn. Uh, Crayon is a new brand that is very yeah. interesting. I think they're rising up. Acrivi has become a kind of a, yeah. a, a huge brand that people are getting behind because Remy, or um, pardon me, um, Rosette Rosepi, who's the uh, watchmaker behind that, is now younger. And I think many mm -hmm. people are looking at the future. A guy in the U.S. who's doing some very interesting things as well. Uh, his name is Josh Shapiro. Okay. Uh, he's known for his rose engine work. Okay. So uh, Rose Engine is basically these small little carvings you do on a Rose Engine machine, like a lathe, and you make these small little cuts. Mm -hmm. uh, he's getting a, not you know, very well known, but he's doing some, yeah. some cool stuff in the United States. Uh, there's a lot to get lost in. Yeah. A lot to get lost in. What about Roger Smith? I mean, he's... Well, Roger Smith yeah. is, I mean, that is like the descendant of... the yeah. Yes, of George Daniels, which easily the greatest watchmaker in the 20th century, okay. his protege, and uh, making some of the best watches in the world without question. Uh, the he classic, does like, what, one piece a year or something? I, I don't even know so. total production, but it's it's absurd. But some of the most beautiful watches in the world, yeah. without question, without question. And then everything, I mean, even the gears, you know, made in yes. house. Like George Daniels, if you ever are interested and you're into just fine bespoke yeah. things, mm -hmm. I mean, there are documentaries out there about him, but he's someone to investigate because what he was able to do, and he was producing small little screws, everything for one of his watches. Yeah. It's, it's remarkable. And he yeah. was basically self-taught. Yeah, but it's crazy. <laughs> I mean, it's like insanity to mm -hmm. think that, you know, again, I mean, that he's doing everything with that degree of precision, but on a miniature scale, right? I mean, these are tiny, tiny pieces. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can only imagine the size of, I mean, how do you, you know, carve the threads into a screw, you know, by oneself? you know, that goes into a watch. It's like, it's remarkable. You know, it really is uh, incredible. And this is, I think, the magic and the romance of a fine timepiece, especially the mechanical timepiece, is the nostalgia of this object telling time, you know, uh, in a way that is no longer necessary, mm -hmm. right? I mean, iPhone tells perfect time. I can set my alarm on my iPhone. I can have 15 time zones, right? But there's still a romance and something behind a fine timepiece that I think even in this day and age is relevant. I totally agree. And just how we said at the beginning, I mean, this is doesn't need to make sense. Yeah. You know, it's not, it's there's a romantic concept of this, but if you're someone that's interested in finer made things, you want to have something that's last, it goes against this disposable yeah. world that we now live mm -hmm. in, and everything has a life cycle of a few years and we're yeah. done with it. Uh, this is the antithesis of that. Yeah. Well, it's the connoisseurship, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, again. You know, the idea that, you know, at a certain level, you really are investing in an heirloom that can be passed on. I mean, you know, Paddock, I think they've got great advertising is that, you know, what's the saying is like, you're merely looking after this. For the next you know, generation. For the next generation. Mm -hmm. And there's a nostalgia to that of wanting to think that the objects that we're acquiring transcend our lives uh, and can, you know, can, uh, you know, persevere, or kind of persist beyond kind of, you know, our finite time on this earth. You know, in bespoke clothing, I think, that, again, there's this misplaced effort or this misplaced emphasis in some ways on the product. I mean, the product is, of course, very important. You know, the integrity and how it's made and how beautiful it is and how it drapes. Uh, but the handwork, you know, that goes into a bespoke garment or a bespoke pair of shoes doesn't exist for the handwork alone, right? Of course, it enhances its beauty, uh, but is, uh, in fact, in many ways, what gives the garment its durability because that handwork you know, effectively memorizes, you know, that garment shape into the way that the garment is made. And so, you know, bespoke pair of shoes last a lifetime, bespoke garments. I mean, this jacket actually, you know, was uh, given to me by a late friend of mine, you know, mm -hmm. that I inherited. And it's like, you know, I had it retailered. It fits great. Uh, and a fine timepiece, you know, you can pass on to a son uh, and they can continue to wear it. And the longer you have it, the more meaningful it becomes. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. What about any favorite timepieces? I mean, just... You know, what was, I mean, were you given a timepiece from a family member or kind of what, what was it that, you know, catalyzed this for you and, you know, set you off on this path where... It, it wasn't one thing, but there was one watch. Uh, I'm from an Italian family. Um, my great-grandfather emigrated from Italy. Okay. And he had 11 children. Yeah, and, no, it's amazing. You know, back in the day. <laughs> back in the, yes. Didn't waste any it's time. A big farm, you know, did a lot of work. Yeah. Yes. Yes. But, you know, it was not, did not come from much money. Yeah. Uh, but... My 
based I mean, my grandfather and then his sibling put all this money together to gift him a watch as the man who came over yeah. for, and in 1958, they gave him this Wittenauer watch, which wow. from a brand now is not well known. Yeah. But it's a it, sentiment. It was a sentiment. Right? Yeah. I mean, engraved, and that's the man I'm named after. Yeah. And that was kind of the cementing of it. Yeah. It wasn't the first thing that got me into it because I was just fascinated. Yeah. I mean, it's like the mechanical, mm-hmm. like the design, everything in it. But then yeah. when I learned about that watch, that was the thing that cemented it all. Yeah. You know, the, the moment where you're like, you know, it, my fate is sealed. Yeah. Right? So does that, this watch still exist in the family? It does. I still have it. Oh, really? Yes. yes. Oh, wow. So, so it's I'm, in your possession. It's in my possession. Oh, wow. So I'm what named after my father, okay. who's also named after my great grandfather, and uh, you know, that's how yeah. basically. It so all... this is the family heirloom. Mm-hmm. Well, we'll have to make sure we get a picture of that for this video. Oh, that's, right. I can uh, send it along. Yeah. yeah. I mean, just the sentimentality of that, I think, is mm-hmm. not to be you know underappreciated, right? I mean, I've got my grandfather's watch, my Rolex, and I still remember like a movie. I mean, vividly the moment when he gave it to me. I mean, it's like, it's just imprinted in my mind. It's like in full color, I can remember that. And you know, he's since passed away. I'll always have that timepiece to remember him and remember that moment. And like, that's special. I mean, I, how I say it is, you know, we, we are given these opportunities of life, but I always see an opportunity as an obligation. And that watch reminds me of not just that, you know, I'm living for myself, but for something more, yeah. right? And it's, it's almost a reminder of where I come from. And yeah. it, it's that one object that can be that peace and reminder because we, we know this. I mean, these are cliche statements, yeah. but uh, that is, you, you see that, like a, a family coming together, you know, pulling all the funds that they had, which was not much. And it was time. a watch that it they chose. It was a chose, watch. You know? It was a watch that they chose. Yeah. And I mean, it could have been anything. They could have bought a pair of shoes or, mm-hmm. a, you know, a Corvette. Mm-hmm. You know, but they didn't. They got him a watch. Yeah, I don't think they had the budget for the Corvette. Yeah, well, then, yeah. But, you know, hey, anyway, you'd understand. But yeah, of course, I'm just kidding. But yeah, no, that's, the Corvette would have been cool too. You uh, have, hey, yeah. <laughs> maybe if you drive around yeah. cars, who knows? They changed yeah. my trajectory. But yes, exactly. I and mean, that's that's what it's all about to me. Yeah. What do you think? Do you think there's a right number of timepieces, right, for a man? I mean, <sighs> you know, I what I always say is the, the least amount that could get you by because yeah. what you'll find is if you get into this, it does get rather addicting. The yeah. same way, like you know, what if I asked you how many suits should you I, have? Yeah. I, I mean the limit almost doesn't exist to an extent because you could justify anything depending on your passion. Passion can bring any justification. But I I do think there's something nice about somewhere between, like I could see a great, like a one watch would be great. Three watches could be great. Uh, I I like also the number, you know, like the seven too, Mm -hmm. because just one for every day of the week, I think that's a nice milestone. Or if you're somebody like the two week rotation type of thing where you want to have maybe a box of 12 or something like that. Like that's something you could <laughs> okay. do, but then, well, then, you, could keep, but then you could keep just, you can keep justifying yeah. things as you start to get further yeah. into it. But it yeah. depends. Well, I mean, I wouldn't consider myself a collector of watch watches. Mm-hmm. I mean, I appreciate fine time pieces, right? And, um, and I've tried to buy some additional watches and I just found myself that, you know, it's like I can actively rotate two watches, mm-hmm. right? I've got, you know, this watch, right? Which is slightly more dressy. It's mm-hmm. got the, you know, leather strap. And then I've got, you know, the Rolex, you know, Datejust, which has, you know, the you gold want. bracelet. And it's like those two watches, it's like, you know, and I tried to add a, a Patek uh, Calatrava, right? Mm-hmm. Which is a very, mm-hmm. you know, kind of very simple, you know, you know, uh, Patek. I mean, it's like their entry level. And I just find that I didn't, that I, there were no situations where I would wear that watch that I wouldn't prefer to wear this one. Hmm. You know, so you have a perpetual, you have something that was gifted by your wife. You have yeah. a watch that was gifted by your grandfather. I mean, but I still, special. you know, like a Patek 5050J or, you know, mm-hmm. or a dual time zone is like, you know, I think a dual time zone might, you know, if, if I were to acquire another watch, it would be a dual time zone. Now, only because, again, I like the, the usability of that complication. You know, something like mm-hmm. a chronometer, like, mm-hmm. you know, it's great. It's a great example of watchmaking technology, but it's never something I'm going to use. I could show off with it, right? Or, you know, I could never use it, right? Mm-hmm. But a dual time zone with the amount that I travel, GMT I think, is, is something that I could certainly justify. It's, it's a great one to have. I mean, even something like this. I mean, this watch has. Well, I was thinking the one on your wrist. Oh, oh, oh that's right. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Sure. <laughs> no, but I mean, you know, for myself, I mean, mm-hmm. something like that would be, you know, an amazing, uh, amazing. Hey, watch. maybe I planted a seed here today. Yeah, we'll that's see right. Or something I mean, else yeah, on his wrist here yeah, soon. Goodness Who knows? gracious. No. <laughs> Uh, Well, Teddy, I mean, thank you. I mean, I know that you also have an online retail store. So many of these watches, I mean, of course, if someone were interested, could go to Yeah, some of these are available, yep. So we are. Yep, we're an authorized retailer of a lot of brands. So if you are looking for a watch, I absolutely love to have your business. And then, of course, your YouTube channel, Mm -hmm. you know, subscribe. And we've got a link in the description of this video. Um, And, uh, you know, thank you for sharing your passion with us uh, and for everything you do for quality 
craftsmanship and tradition, of course. Kirby, I'm a big yeah. fan. It's a pleasure to be here with yeah, you. Yeah, this has been so much fun. Thank, Thank you. you, Kirby.